Um, the reasons for atheism, or as I would prefer to say, anti-theism, are, I would say, as follows. The first and the simplest objection to religious belief is that its metaphysical claims are not true, in fact are false, and come from a period that I would describe as the infancy or the, the fearful childhood of our species, when because we have brains that seek for information and seek for an explanation, brains that even now prefer a conspiracy theory to no theory at all, and are bound to do so, and indeed in some ways a right to seek in this way, uh, explanations had to be found for things that seemed at the time inexplicable. <clears throat> and in the absence of crucial information, uh, we didn't know, we had no way to know that the Earth went around the Sun. Didn't know that there was a germ theory that would explain disease. Didn't have any means of knowing that earthquakes were the result of living on the crust of a cooling planet in a rather odd solar system where most of the planets are either too hot or too cold to support life and our own is in large part too hot or too cold to support it either and where the remainder lives on a climatic knife edge and always has. Some design, by the way, and that's just of one solar system. Um, we didn't know that uh, matters of this kind, earthquakes, waves, disasters, were not punishments. Uh, it was quite possible to, le to listen to those and even to believe those who thought that they could explain. But for these people, a double problem arises. Um, there is first the difficulty of, if not the impossibility, of demonstrating the existence of any creator or designer at all. I think I say something uncontroversial when I say that no theologian has ever conclusively demonstrated that such a designer can or does or ever had, has existed. Uh, the most you can do uh, by way of the argument for design is to infer him or her or it from an apparent harmony in the arrangements. And this was at a time when that was the very best that, so to speak, could be done. But religion goes a little further than this already rather impossible task and expects us to believe as follows that the speaker not only can prove the existence of the said entity, <coughs> but can claim to know this entity's mind. In fact, can claim to know it quite intimately. Can claim to know his or her personal wishes. Can, in turn, tell you what you may do in his name. A, a quite large arrogation of power, you will suddenly notice, is being granted to the speaker here. The speaker can tell you that he knows, he cannot tell you how, but he can tell you that he knows, for example, that heaven hates ham. That God doesn't want you to eat pork products. He can tell you that God has a very, very strong view about with whom you may have sexual relations. Indeed, how you may have sexual relations with others. Uh, he can indicate, perhaps a little less convincingly, but no less firmly, that there are certain books or courses of study that you might want to avoid or treat with great suspicion. Now, this suggests to me uh, already a design. I think I can see a design shaping up here, and I think I can see who designed it and created it. I think it was man-made. I think the whole inference, because you can certainly see a design at work, is that this is human, uh, that it was designed at a time of great distress and great ignorance, and that it had an enormous advantage, the design of which can be inferred from every one of its practices. It gives to people, ministers, priests, rabbis, shamans, whoever cell phone that is should know that we know where you live, by the way, <laughs> and where your children go to school. Um, it gives to those people power in the here and now, the only place where it really counts. If you are His Holiness the Pope and you have uh, aggregated to yourself, for example, the power to bind and to loose, and to decide who may read what, and how many tithes must be paid, and how many holy days must be observed, how many disciplines must be followed. Uh, are you seeking power in the, in the hereafter, or are you seeking it now? It seems to me very obvious, that uh, inescapable conclusion, that it's temporal power that's being talked about. And of a very dictatorial kind, I might add, an absolutist kind, a kind that is not open to the ordinary challenges. The divine right of kings was something you had to challenge not just at the risk of your life, which might end quickly, though the end itself would be slow and painful, the, the end would be, would be uh, final, uh, but you were told you risked your immortal soul and the rest of your life too. That's quite a powerful instrument of secular discipline. And everyone can name their favorite example, I think, of how and uh, where 
that kind of tyranny over the minds as well as the bodies of men was exerted. We think of it as belonging to our prehistory, but we only have to look oh, as far as today's Iran, for example, to see a classic theocracy, a country from which I've recently returned, where I wondered how to convey sometimes the flavor of what theocracy really is like. Um, well, if you're a woman who gets in trouble with the regime and is, has committed a capital offense in Iran, but you're underage, you're a virgin, you may not be sentenced to death <clears throat> under the law of Iran because the law forbids the execution of virgins. But you may be raped by the Revolutionary Guards so that you're no longer a virgin in the prison and then executed. I think that sort of conveys what people feel they're allowed to do when they think they have God on their side. And I could tell you far worse than that about what the arrogance of power is when it thinks it's backed by, by uh, the divine. Well, this arrogation of power in the, in the material world is really nothing compared to the dictatorship that is suggested by those who infer the whole celestial design that backs it. Uh, that's why I want to uh, spend a moment or two telling you why I'm an anti-theist. You may be an atheist and wish that there was a God who loved you and took care of you. It's possible. Um, but just to decide there isn't enough evidence for it. Just as Mr. Jefferson was a deist, uh, but didn't believe in religion. He didn't think God intervened. Um, these positions are equally compatible. I know several atheists who would happily say that they wish it were true, but that they can't find that it is believable. My own view is that it's uh, very fortunate for us that it isn't true, and I shall say why. If there was a supervising creator who took a personal interest in your life, what you would have from the moment of your conception, one, at least in one interpretation, would be a permanent, inescapable, unchangeable, unalterable, unchallengeable rule which would involve round-the-clock surveillance and supervision of every single waking and sleeping moment of your life. The abolition of any privacy in your life or even in your mind and your most private thoughts. The most complete form of totalitarianism ever imagined. And indecent, too, when you think of how many private moments would have to be supervised in this way and invigilated permanently. And that would go on not just for the rest of your life, as it would if you lived in Iran. It would go on after you died. In fact, after you died, the real invigilation would begin. They'd only have started with you at the moment when you left this veil of tears. The two offers are um, at that point, as you will know, at least from all the two, two of the leading monotheisms, either an eternity of praise and servility, everlasting praise and adoration of someone who has only done his job by creating you, hasn't been invited to do so, a proposition that sounded more like hell to me when I first heard about it, or a very much more unpleasant one, derived not from the Old Testament but from the New. There's no hell in the Old Testament. There's genocide, there's racism, there's slavery, there's child mutilation. There's all, everything else you could wish for, but there's no punishment of the dead. Not until the, the arrival of the gentle Nazarene is it suggested that for a crime you probably were forced to commit, because after all, you're created a sinner. You're created sick and commanded to be well, the essence of the totalitarian principle. Uh, but for that, you might face an eternity of torture, for, to which there'll be no end. Now, I think this is a horrible proposition. I think those who wish for it are wishing for slavery and civility, for the abdication of their own responsibility, for the dissolution of their minds, for the abolition of their individuality. I'm therefore very glad to say that there is no evidence for it at all. We can relax. I've been to all three axes of evil countries, actually, in the, in the last uh, four years, including North Korea. I'm the only writer who can claim to have done this, and Iraq. And it took me a long time, but now I do know what it would be like uh, well, the question is, how to answer the question I had when I was little, what would it be like to have to praise someone all the time, from the moment you got up till the moment you lay down again? And that would be your only right and your only recreation, and it would be the only culture that you had, because in North Korea, that's what you get to do. In North Korea, you can praise the dear leader, and you can praise the great leader. The great leader and the dear leader are, in fact, the same person. They're reincarnations of each other, according to the dogma. The place is only one step short of a trinity, the, uh, the dear leader who we lampoon 
dwarf, is only the head of the party and the army, not of the state. His father's head of the state. Father's dead now, has been dead for some years, but he's still the head of the state and will be forever. North Korea is therefore what one might call, I tried to call, a necrocracy. <laughs> or a morsalocracy, perhaps. Or a thanatocracy. And you have the right only to praise and adore and thank for every single thing that you get. You owe thanks to these people. That's what it would feel like. The most unending pointlessness, the most unending nothingness, nullity, smashing of the personality, destruction of everything that counts as self-respect or dignity. But at least you can die and get out of North Korea. And you cannot do this with Abrahamic religion, which I therefore announce as something essentially uh, evil. Now, one consequence of its man-made character, and one reason, one reason, I won't say reason, one way of demonstrating uh, beyond very much doubt that it is man-made is its proliferation. Uh, we have, I think, two choices here. Either man-made God or God-made man. If it's the uh, former, um, nothing much remains to be explained. If it's God-made man, it's very hard to see why there are so many religions and why they're constantly at war with one another. Make the opposite assumption that man has invented religion and God. Nothing is left to be explained. There is no mystery. There are, of course, innumerable proliferating cults, sects, confessional discrepancies, uh, warring uh, churches, schismatic groups. Most of the violence in Iraq, as we know, is not directed at our own brave soldiers and their allies among Iraqis, but at other Iraqis who, by other Muslims who think it's uh, cultural to blow up each other's mosques, something the secularist would never agree to do, to blow up, say, the Golden Dome at Samara. We know from pre-monotheistic times, we know from, from Sophocles and Antigone, that any person of ordinary morality has a natural resistance to desecration, to profanity. We wouldn't do that. We would leave it to the religious to do it, which you always can. The last time American troops were needed in a context like this, it was because the Christians of Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina and Croatia were tearing each other's throats out, burning each other's churches, killing each other's children, all of it with a divine warrant, all of them, every last one of them, a faith based. On that occasion, the Muslims were the most civilized people in the case. It doesn't make any difference. Almost everybody gets, as it were, their turn at bat uh, to, be the, to be the most intolerant among the religious. But to say that this is um, a man-made, uh, it seems to me to say something that's almost uh, obvious. Now, I'm saying all this... Uh, and, about a minute. Okay, I'm saying all this in the United States, uh, where I must now say something I've been waiting for months to say, actually years to say, my fellow Americans. Um, <laughs> thank you. I sometimes think you don't understand how lucky you are. Yours is the country that has the only constitution ever written that absolutely insists on the separation of these ideas from the state. Uh, when, the, when the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, wrote to Mr. Jefferson calling for a wall of separation, they were worried about what? what who did they think was going to persecute them? The Congregationalists of Danbury, Connecticut, was the one they were afraid of. And rightly so, because the Congregationalists would have given them a really hard time if they'd been allowed to, if they could have seized any local power. This fighting, not just about religion, but between the religious, this desire to have the freedom not just of religion, but from religion, is enshrined in the founding documents of this country in a way that should make you very proud. And it should therefore put you very much on your guard that there are people who don't seem content with it, who seem always to wish to uh, impose their own religious belief on this. To say, if only we could ban alcohol, as in the 20s, we'd have a more pure and perfect union. If only we could forbid the teaching of evolution or get equal time for pseudoscience, like the alchemy class that follows the chemistry period in presumably these schools or the astrology class that uh, comes after the astronomy studies moment, uh, everything will be fine. Resist this with every fiber of your being. Join me, in fact, in my new favorite slogan. Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hitchens, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Olasky, your move. <clears throat> Well, I, I share Christopher's concern about round-the-clock surveillance, but I need to point out that we are in Texas, and we tend to sing in almost a ritualistic fashion. The eyes of Texas are upon you. You cannot get away. You may think you can't escape them. Rise up early in the morn. The eyes of Texas are upon you until...
Gabriel blows his horn. The um, religious sentiment there uh, is something that uh, a lot of us do believe in. Uh, in other ways, we have certainly a, uh, a separation of, of church and state, although certainly not a separation of university and football. Um, I'll rebut some of your specific statements later on, but I, I want to start with the big picture. Um, when the second terrorist airplane on 9-11 hit the World Trade Center, uh, ABC's Diane Sawyer was speechless for a moment, and then she uttered a soft, oh, my God. And that, I suspect, is what a lot of us said. And the question is, are we crazy? I, I appreciate your guts in, in defending the war against terror. You've taken a lot of heat for that. Uh, I also appreciate your remarkable accomplishments in both speaking and writing. Um, as for me, I'm just a writer. I really am. I've been in about three debates in 15 years. I tend to sit with my laptop and try to think things through. So. I hope you'll all excuse me if I work off some notes here. I'm a, I'm a writer, not a talker. And with a limited amount of time, I don't want to wing it. So let me start with a confession. When Evan here pushed me to take on this debate, I, I finally agreed, as you'll recall, but I predicted that Christopher would wipe the floor with me. Uh, but now, having read his book, having listened to him, I'm more optimistic. <laughs> the, uh, the change is not because of my oratorical oh, ability. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, you know, my, my oratorical ability is, is minimal, but you have a weak case. And of course, some people motivated by religion have done all kinds of terrible mischief and mayhem. Of course, that's irrefutable. But then you go and insist in the subtitle of your book and throughout it that religion poisons everything. And that's a hard charge to prove, I think. Everything? Ev everything? It sounds, it sounds improbable. Are, are 1.3 billion Muslims all murderers? Are 1 billion Hindus all nutty? Might Judaism and Christianity have produced maybe 50% good and 50% evil? If not, how about 45% good? Well, 40%, 30%, 20%? Um, Will not Christopher relent from his anger uh, if there's 10% that's good? I've, uh, I've gone page by page through, uh, through this book. It's a delightful book to read, especially preparing for debate because of all the extreme statements. Um, I could just lay it out page after page after page, but that would be a very dull presentation. There's also Texas wisdom, you know, if you don't strike oil within 20 minutes, stop boring. So I'm going to challenge just a few representative points. Um, on page four, Christopher, you write that religion produces a maximum of servility. All religions? With that enormous variety of religions in the world that you pointed out, do generalizations like that make sense? And just looking at the Bible, you read it through, were Abraham and Moses and David and, and Job, were they servile? And they all argued with God at various times. They weren't servile. On page seven, you write that religion spoke its last intelligible or noble or inspiring words a long time ago. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. speeches with all their biblical imagery were certainly inspiring. Um, many UT students, many students I had heard the Dalai Lama when he spoke here, and they were inspired. And Pope John Paul II's words inspired many people to rise up against communism in Eastern Europe. On page 17, you write that religion does not have the confidence in its own various preachings even to allow coexistence between different faiths. You know, there's an annual pro-life march in Washington, not far from your home. There are over 100,000 Catholics and Protestants every year. They walk side by side along with groups from Jews for life, Buddhists for life, and so forth. On page 32, you write that the... 19 suicide murderers of New York and Washington and Pennsylvania were beyond any doubt the most sincere believers on those planes. Well, you know, Todd Beamer, the man who said, let's roll on United Flight 93, and he and others made sure it didn't crash into the U.S. Capitol. You know, he was a strong, sincere Christian believer. We did a profile of an interview with his wife and so forth afterwards in, in World Magazine, and, and the others have stopped the terrorists. There were a lot of believers there. And they died when Flight 93 crashed in Pennsylvania. Um, here go on. I'll, I'll skip to page 102. 
write that quote, it goes without saying that none of the gruesome disordered events described in Exodus ever took place. Okay, without saying, none. A slam dunk. Next, page 103, all the mosaic myths can be safely and easily discarded. Well, maybe they can be, but not easily. There are a lot of very thoughtful people who have spent years of their lives looking at it and trying to figure out what's going on there. On page 104, next page, all five books of Moses are an ill carpentered fiction. Now, a lot of pronouncements like that were made back in the 19th century, particularly the late 19th century. But again and again, biblical accounts considered mythical have gained new archaeological support and respect. You know, scholars at one point back in the 19th century said that the Hittites described in the Bible did not exist, nor did rulers such as Belshazzar of Babylon or Sargon of Assyria. And of course, archaeologists now have recorded all those civilizations, those reigns. There have been lots of brilliant people who have spent their lifetime studying those writings that you so readily dismiss. Uh, uh, for instance, Robert Wilson, he knew 26 ancient languages and dialects. He could read just about all that remains from the ancient Near East. And he was impressed with the accuracy of those accounts that you so readily discard. You, you remind me, I, I admire your speaking and writing, you remind me of a character in the great movie, I hope many of us have seen it, The Princess Bride. There's a character, Vizzini. He's so smart that he says, have you ever heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, morons? Well, you're a little too quick to dismiss some of these folks from the infancy of the human race. You know, great theologians, great historians, and, and sure, I mean, of course we know more about science and medicine and technology and lots of other things than people used to, but are we wiser than Socrates? Are we wiser than Isaiah? You write on page 160, one knew, of course, that the whole racket of American evangelism was just that, a heartless con. You know that everything in American evangelism is a heartless con, a racket? I've been a reporter over the past 20 years. I've reported stories from around the country of people who, well, maybe or maybe, or maybe not they're heartless, but they're evidently very stupid because they've spent their time in a racket that's yielded them no money. I mean, you live in Washington. You could easily visit some of these racketeers. Uh, you could drive for an hour or so north to uh, Harford County, Maryland, north of Baltimore, just west of the Susquehanna. It's a land of forested rolling hills, leafy neighborhoods, small towns. They're you know, playing a losing game of tug of war with the strip shopping centers and the malls and the fast food eateries and the housing developments. So it's pretty typical, sort of exurban area in some ways, but there's, hey, there's one small church in that county that I've gotten to know pretty well. Mount Zion has at least 30 families in it who have adopted kids, often hard to place kids. You could visit the home. It's easy. You can, I mean, I'll be glad to arrange it for you. You could visit the home of one family, the Coonies. They own what was a three-bedroom uh, split level at the end of a cul-de-sac, nothing fancy, but now it has seven bedrooms because the Coonies have adopted nine kids. And most of those kids have some kind of mental or physical handicap. There's one who's 19, he has autism and mild mental retardation, severe bipolar disorder. There's one who was 16 and was set fire, he was born in Ghana and set fire there 10 years ago. She has daunting medical needs, but, uh, but Terry Cooney said God was so clear. I mean, that's her racket, evidently, to take care of these kids. They have a 14-year-old Stephen who weighed only two pounds when he was born. He was born with cerebral palsy, and the Coonies adopted him. Their 11-year-old Isaac was the sixth child of a drug-addicted prostitute. They adopted him. In every case, they did it because of their Christian beliefs. So does religion poison everything? Um, you know, there's no evidence for religion at all. Well, there's some evidence of what Christianity did in their lives, that they do this. And the Coonies could show you around, you know, other people who, have, who are involved with this heartless con, this racket. There's another friend of mine in Mount Zion Church named Benedict Schwartz. Um, he's the CEO of a software company, but he's left that now for, a, well, he's, he's moving to Africa next month. He's uh, already adopted a daughter. Uh, he, want, he wants to save some AIDS orphans in Africa. He began praying with a group of Mount Zion members about whether the church should found an orphan's home in Africa. And there were some folks who wanted the sanctuary to get air conditioning first, but the pastor agreed with Benedict that, uh, that helping people in Africa was a higher priority. Now, two summers ago, my wife and I visited the outcome of that discussion. It's called the Children of Zion Home. It's in Namibia. We met the 50 children who live there. Most of them have lost at least one parent to AIDS. There are several, including, well, one boy who was living in a tire who were rescued from slavery. There were two deaf boys who had lived in the streets. There were 11 children, uh, last count, who, known, who were known to carry the HIV virus. 
that orphanage would not exist except for Christian belief. Now, you know, next month my wife and I will be back in Africa visiting another orphanage. This is the one that Benedict is moving to Africa to build in Zambia. And that's what one church has done. You know, on the cover of this issue of World, yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a photo of a child that my wife and I met at a Christian work in South Africa. You know, you could look at this kid and you could say, well, he's getting some food and, you know, it's to my knowledge, it wasn't poisonous food, he didn't drop dead. Tell him that religion poisons everything. You don't have to go to South Africa to see that. I mean, you, you live in Northwest Washington. Um, you write books with this absolutist, you could almost call it a sort of totalitarian fundamentalist rhetoric in some ways of, hey, everything is exactly, I know everything about this and I know it's all a con. All you have to do is go a few miles to poverty-stricken Southeast Washington. Uh, you could visit, for example, the, the Children of Mind program in Anacostia. Uh, I've been there a few times. Uh, Hannah Hawkins started, she's invested two decades. She invested two decades in this. It's an after-school program. Kids go there. And she said that without Jesus, you're empty. You're just out to sea floating. You don't know where to go. And she gives her life for those kids. And there are efforts like this all around this country. I'm glad you're a citizen. I hope you get a chance to, to see some of these. You know, if there, if there are folks in the audience here who believe that religion poisons everything, which is what Christopher wants to tell us, you don't have to go to Maryland or Washington to, to see differently. I've, I've driven down I-35 and visited with Freddy Garcia in his San Antonio home. He, he used to be an addict, and he was a hater of white non-Hispanics. Then he became a Christian and started this program called Victory Outreach. He's led hundreds of people out of drug abuse. He counsels folks of all skin colors. Um, you can't tell me that religion poisons everything. There are dozens of ex-addicts. I've interviewed them. They've told me that Christianity fought the poison that almost killed them. You know, or you or anyone here, you could drive east on 290 to Houston to visit the youth home that Kurt and Shelley Williams set up. These are also people I admire. They've helped to transform the lives of hundreds of teenagers who are heading into drugs and crime. They say, quote, we are unapologetically a Christ-based program. You know, or anyone here can drive up I-35. You can drive to Dallas. You can meet Christians who have set up community centers and former crack homes. You know, tell them that religion poisons everything. You know, or tell that, I mean, I, I won't give you the whole tour, but, uh, you know, tell that to a gymnast in Indianapolis, a guy named Tim Street, uh, lots of others there. There's a, I met a paraplegic weightlifter in Philadelphia named Nemo Cologne. You know, tell him that religion poisons everything. Religion saved his life. You know, tell it to a pastor named John Piper in Minneapolis. He and his congregation work with Hmong and Somali refugees there. You know, hey, this is a great country, Christopher. You're a citizen now. Go see it. And you can reply that you've seen terrible things done for religion reason, religious reasons. I believe you. I've seen terrible things done, too. There are lots of religious things that poison some things. And maybe you'll tell me the subtitle was put there by your publisher over your objections, that you really don't believe that religion poisons everything. Well, then we'd be making progress, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, or, you know, other, I won't go on, the, the history of Christian poverty fighting in America. Uh, before you say that religion poisons everything, okay, take the metro from your home, go over to the Library of Congress, read there about a fellow named Charles Brace. This was a guy in the mid-19th century. He was motivated by his Christian beliefs. He walked the streets of New York City and wanted to gain a personal understanding of the problems that orphans faced there. And over a 40-year period, he built lodging houses in New York City that provided shelter to tens of thousands of abandoned kids. He placed 91,000 of them in adoptive homes over a 40-year period. Um, I'll tell you, one of the best days I've ever spent in research was at the Chicago Historical Society. Uh, I just spent a day reading the journals of a woman named Helen Mercy Woods. Again, motivated by her Christian beliefs, from 1881 to 1903, she ran a shelter in Chicago for pregnant and unmarried women. And you just read these journals, I and mean, month after month she's giving attention to these women who have been discarded by their boyfriends or parents or anyone, and she helped them rejoice as their babies were born, and she helped some of them to get married, others to place their kids for adoption, others to get jobs. I could, I could mention hundreds of more, I've written about this, but, you know, uh, they weren't in an evangelical racket. Their Christian beliefs actually helped them to understand that there were a lot more things more important than money. Uh, there's another sector of American history. I mean, you mentioned the, the, the separation of powers. A lot of that is because of the Christian understanding early in American, in American history that, in fact, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you don't want to concentrate power. It's very different than Islam, which believes in concentrating power in caliphs who are the religious and military uh, and political heads. The whole idea in America coming out of this Christian idea of, of sin and lots of sin to go around 
was that you spread it around. You have a separation of powers. And that comes out of, out of a Christian understanding. Uh, or the whole reason that, that you and I can be independent journalists is because of Christianity. Until 1735 in this country, journalists had one job description, to make the king and his associates look good. If you wrote something negative about an important person, truth was no defense at all. In fact, truth made it worse. They had an expression, the greater the truth, the greater the libel. Because if you wrote something that was true, it was more likely that people would believe it. And if you were, in many ways, discouraging people to put all their faith in the king or royal governor, then you'd be thrown in jail. Truth was no defense at all. So just as libel. In 1735 in New York, there was a, a Christian newspaper writer named John Peter Zenger, who wrote that the governor was taking bribes and stealing land, which indeed he was. And so he ended up in jail. And then came the trial. And you can read the transcript of the trial. Zenger's lawyer appealed to the members of the jury by reminding them that biblical prophets had criticized the kings of their time. Uh, Zenger's defense essentially was, hey, if God's authors did this, so can Zenger. And the jury bought it. The jury declared Zenger not guilty. And that verdict reverberated through the colonies, and there wasn't a single prosecution for seditious libel after that. And, you know, Christopher, you note on page 271 that you don't have to put up with any fatwas here. I'll tell you, a lot of that's because of Christianity. Religion does not poison everything. And there are, there are others who have concluded this as well. I mean, I'm, I don't want to just talk about my research. They, uh, I met a couple of weeks ago Bob Woodbury, who's uh, an assistant professor in sociology here. And he just uh, he sent me his dissertation that he wrote recently at the University of North Carolina. I hope it's published. Because he, he describes how Protestant missionaries advanced education in British colonies because they wanted the people to read the Bible in their own language. And they created schools. They had mass literacy campaigns. And sure, I mean, you can look at missionaries who did harm, lots of it. But Woodbury shows, and he has lots of multiple regression analyses and all that good stuff, that evangelism, I'm quoting here, evangelism by 1900 is by far the most constant predictor of modern elementary education all over the world with their British colonies. And that's part of an overall pattern. You can read uh, historian Elizabeth Eisenstein. I mean, she's shown the Protestant Reformation led to the, a huge development of mass literacy in Europe. And Christians took the lead over the centuries in setting up hospitals. I mean, you can read the works of Jonathan Hill from your alma mater, Oxford, or... Uh, Alvin Schmidt from Illinois, or Rodney Stark of Baylor. And they can show you, they can show you the long-term effect of Jesus telling his followers to love their neighbors as themselves. And these writers, I mean, they're by no means propagandists. They're careful scholars. And, you know, your subtitle, How Religion Poisons Everything, compare that with the subtitle of one of Professor Stark's books. His subtitle is How Monotheism Led to Reformations, Science, Witch Hunts, and the End of Slavery. So the good and the bad. And that's, that's a more balanced view, and that's, that's what I hope you'll, you'll come to. I mean, this evangelical tendency, one minute, yeah, to help others, not poison them, continues today. Uh, Nicholas Kristof wrote in the New York Times that America's evangelicals have become the newest internationalists, fighting sexual trafficking in Eastern Europe, slavery in Sudan. Uh, there's a Jewish leader, Michael Horowitz, who gave me a call this afternoon. We were just talking about stuff, and he reminded me of what he had written to evangelicals. Here's what he wrote. You have led the way in taking on the slavery issue of our time the annual trafficking of millions of women and children into lives of sexual bondage. You have led the way in organizing a campaign to end a growing epidemic of prison rape. As you define your human rights successes as central to who you are and what you've done, it will no longer be possible for those who fear your faith to crudely caricature you or ignore the virtue that Christian activism brings to American life and the world at large. And Michael spoke too soon because despite all the evidence, Christopher, you write that religion poisons everything. You really don't believe that, do you? Everything? Thanks. All right, 10 minutes. Mr. Hitchens. Good work. Thanks. Go get him. Well, I would have thought it was too much to expect that uh, uh, this, my other speaker would have devoted all his remarks to me, too. I mean, they don't exaggerate when they say Texas hospitality. <laughs> uh, it's very kind of him to make of me his special subject, but let me try and take some of his points in order. First, some, a very small one, the Diane Sawyer point. I think she did say that when she saw the second plane go in, but I've seen the film, the only film there is, of the first plane going in. Uh, it's rather harder to see, but, um, and so you get the first words that are said in the post-9-11 era, or the immediate post-atrocity moment, and those words are spoken by a man on a big fire truck in New York, where the camera is mounted, and he says, can you guess? Yes, you can. Holy shit. <laughs> and that was exactly a correct description of what was going on. 
much more accurate than Diane Sawyer calling on God, which even I will do when I've run out of words or above all uh, concepts. Yes, of course I'll say thank God. Uh, what else is there to say? I'll say it, um, as a, if you like, as a, as a courtesy, but um, don't, uh, don't over-attribute it. Now, had I said that um, philanthropy was poison or charity was poison, I think you would have probably had me over a barrel. Um, I say in my book, I give quite a lot of time to it, actually. I have a moment in Africa, in northern Uganda, where I was recently. <coughs> I don't just sit in northwest Washington, as it happens. <coughs> where w I was doing the following thing. I was seeing the, the uh, progress of probably the most cruel and horrible war, not just in Africa, but anywhere in the world, uh, since I should think the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. I think it outpaces the Darfur War in its horror and cruelty, if not in its scale, for this reason. You've probably heard of the Lord's Resistance Army of northern Uganda and of its terrible leader, Mr. Joseph Kony, who wants to impose the rule of the Ten Commandments on Uganda. He's a former altar boy and whose army is made up of kidnapped children who are turned into zombies and sadists at a very young age and sent out to kidnap other children to replenish the ranks. And there's a, there's a real evil to this because, of course, um, even the... The Acholi tribe, the people who suffer most from this ghastliness, don't want very rigorous me measures taken against this terrifying little army of children for fear that their own kidnapped children will be killed. So it's a, a sort of double indemnity. And it's, it's enormously retarded the recovery of Uganda in the name of God. And though it's a Christian force, very explicitly so, its paymasters are actually the Sudanese murderers who commissioned the genocide in Darfur because they... They want a revenge on Uganda for Uganda's help for the South Sudanese Liberation Army. So it's all a wonderful faith-based nightmare down there. And I was sitting in a camp of where these children are gradually, when they, some of them come in and give themselves up, some of them are captured, some of them get lost and are picked up. Terrifying children with guns and, and eyes that, of stone um, who've learned so much about cruelty in such a short time that it, 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 it shrivels your heart being rehabilitated. And the people doing this were a rather fundamentalist, but very decent Christian group. Can't remember exactly which, the World Forum something. And I was sitting with the, the man who ran it and said, well, I'd like to ask you a question. I said, as an unbeliever, which of you do you think is the most sincere Christian? I mean, here's Mr. Coney who really goes out and fights like an Old Testament man and, and says he's going to impose the law of his tribe and his people and his teachings on everyone. And he wants the Ten Commandments and nothing else. And there's you. And you're doing what any secular group could do. I mean, Amnesty International could be doing what he was doing. I mean, not Amnesty International, in fact, but you know what I mean. Human Rights Watch, in fact, in Uganda is doing that and much more. And I know literally hundreds of secular missionaries and human rights workers who you do what they do for its own sake, not to proselytize for a church or witness for a faith. Actually, to my surprise, the man took the question very seriously. He said, I often asked it myself. I don't know which of us is the real Christian. I have no means of knowing. Maybe, maybe it's Joseph Kony, maybe it's me. Well, you see, my case is the following. There's, there really couldn't be another answer to that, because if you need a Christian or religious reason to do what you ought to be doing anyway for your fellow creatures, it seems to me at best superfluous, and at worst, perhaps slightly, just very slightly, I don't mean to denigrate anybody's humane work, slightly suspect. Why would you need an extra reason? I hope I'm making myself plain here. Why, could it be proselytization? It very often is. Uh, could it be the feeling that you yourself will get an eternal reward for it? Well, you're supposed to. Um, secularists who undertake this kind of work can't be suspected of this kind of thing, nor of trying to win converts. It seems to me it's an optional belief. By all means, have it. What you've said is being done by any of the people you've mentioned is being done by religious Jews in, on the West Bank, though they want to bring on the Messiah and Armageddon and bring about the end of the world, and by Muslim groups everywhere. In fact, Hamas and is, uh, it justifies its whole rule in Gaza, a disgusting dictatorship that it is, by, the, by its provision of social services to the poor, the needy, or as Mother Teresa would always put it, the poorest of the poor. That's exactly their justification. The same is true of Hezbollah in Lebanon. If you allow it once, you allow it for everybody. It isn't an argument. It's barely even an observation. And when I said about evangelicals, I meant to say, and I said about a very revealing film which you may have seen about Marjo Gortner, the little boy who was put on, onto the preaching circuit by his parents. His name is an anagram of Mary and Joseph, uh, and became one of the biggest tent drawers around the country, a, a national superstar, while his life was ruined and exploited by these gruesome parents. And I don't know.
just so these people can make their escape under cover of night. Uh, I don't remember the, whether it's said of the firstborn of Egypt that they were members of the Al-Qaeda organization or whatever fantastic allegation you made against the Amalekites who are so thoroughly destroyed that we'll never know anything about them, like the Albigensians. We hardly know what the heresy was because of what, what a thorough job the Pope did. See how the Christians love each other, by the way, on these occasions. Um, what did the firstborn of Egypt ever do to this loving God that they should have their lives taken so his chosen people can run away? What's moral about believing this? What morally normal person will say they want the destruction of children for their redemption in Canaan? Professor Weinberg, Stephen Weinberg puts it quite well, I think. He says, um, for uh, <coughs> in a morally normal universe situation, people of good will will do the best they can, and people of ill will, psychopathic types, wicked types, evil types, will, will do the worst. They will do wicked things. If you want to get good people to do wicked things, you need religion. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that who, when they see a newborn baby arriving in their life, if anyone's ever thought, even myself, well, maybe there is something to this. Look at the, look at the perfection of this little bundle. Look at the little indentations, all of that, and the finger, fingertips. Um, the, the most you know, leathery old cynic uh, like myself can have these feelings. We're not total strangers to the transcendent and the numinous, you know. But, but they said, I tell you what, though, before we go any further, we need to get a sharp knife or a stone from somewhere and start hacking away at the genitalia of this little bundle. Because if we don't, we uh, won't be doing God's will. Now, where is, no moral person would do such a thing unless they thought it was divinely warranted. No moral person, I say, would... Uh, show contempt and disgust about the female birth canal, as all religions invariably do, and about activities related to it, I may say, in both directions. Uh, revol revulsion from it, disgust from it, scorn from it, um, and for all other forms of sexual uh, congress, there seems to be a dread underlying all of this, a dread about the genitalia, uh, a horror of women, a horror of their monthly effusions, uh, a disgust, as I say, for their for their vaginas, that I don't find healthy. But it seems to me, in two senses, man-made. One, mammal-made, and two, made so that men can subordinate women, which seems to be a consistent finding in all religions. You will know that the pious Jew has to begin every day saying, God is to be thanked for not making me a woman or a Gentile. That's not moral preaching. No one goes around talking nonsense like that unless they think they have divine permission for it. Religion is therefore yes. A poison because it spoils even righteous acts now I you I don't blame you for not reading all my book and I certainly don't blame you for not quoting all of it and by the way we will just have to have a wager on what you said in yours and I'll stand to my part of it but I do spend a bit of time on this question of virtue when a Muslim cab driver who found a great deal of my money and my wife's money on the back of his back seat of his taxi and knew very well he could have kept it we had no means of finding him went to the trouble he did to bring it back and give it to us and say, well, that's his Muslim duty. Wouldn't even accept when I tried to give him 10%, because I, I knew probably that would be an insult. Uh, really, do, because it was his Muslim duty. Uh, first, I want to make two points. One is, um, I think that's trying to prove too much. I don't think it's at all to the credit of the Prophet Muhammad, or the Quran, or the Archangel Gabriel, who dictated the nonsense of the Quran to him, that this happens. I think the guy should have done what I would do. You find someone else's money, you take it back to him. If you want to be thought of as a moral person, you just do that. You've done the right thing. It's enough. What is this saying? It's a religious duty. It seems to me to pollute the integrity of the thing. The second is, if you use that to prove that Islam is a good influence, you have a lot of work still ahead of you. A great deal of work. All your work is still to come, as it is in your invocations of charity and philanthropy. You've proved absolutely nothing at all. You haven't even suggested a defense of religion as a moral or ethical thing. I think that's all I need to say for now. Okay. Thank you. Finally, to conclude, Mr. Olasky, Dr. Olasky. Well, you've, you've given us, Christopher, a lot of excellent lines from your book, and, and I recommend it to people. I mean, it's, it's, it's witty. Very handsome of you. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's well written. Um, I think sticking with it and, and writing as you do, I mean, does, does show a certain virtue, although you may not like that term. And that's one of the things I've tried to point out in the, in the book you refer to, that 
lots of things are important in, in war and in debate, and, and one thing that's very important is, is character and virtue and leadership. People will follow those they admire uh, and often won't others. So all these things are important to take, to take account of. Uh, but I'm troubled here by the way that you speak and you, and you continue to speak with absolute certainty about all these things. And in fact, if our existence is random, it's all random, uh, why should we trust what you say at all? Why should we believe it at all? It's, it's a random utterance. Uh, you could do something entirely different half an hour from now. It's all random. Uh, the, the, we could talk more about a lot of the points you, you raised. The, the Amalekites, of course, were not wiped out. If you're familiar with the Book of Esther, uh, Haman is one of their descendants. And actually, in Jewish lore, Hitler was a descendant, and so forth. So, you know, there are a lot of things we could talk about. I mean, you say this is, you say this is madness. You're generalizing about all religions again, men subordinating women, and so forth. Um, let me just talk about that. Uh, and and, and this, this actually ties in with this whole question you've raised about whether any of these scriptures could possibly be believable, that perhaps uh, they were all written as propaganda booklets. The, let's look at the, at the Gospels. Um, if they were just propaganda, their authors were really idiots for giving women a vital role in the founding of religion. They showed women as the first witnesses to the empty tomb. That would just add to suspicion as to whether Christ truly rose from the dead. Uh, the, the positive view of women that you see in the New Testament is so different from a negative one that, that dominated some of the other cultures around them. The, uh, well, there's, there's just so much here. The, um, the precision and specific detail, I mentioned one thing that appeals to me as a, as a journalist in the, in the Gospels. Uh, there's been a long-running debate about whether they were written pretty soon after Jesus, within the first several decades, or whether they were written much later. Five years ago, uh, I remember an account the, uh, when the monitor, the, the USS monitor from the Civil War, was pulled up from the ocean bottom. And experts were surprised to find braces on the gun turret that were undocumented by all the literature at the time. People thought they knew pretty much about how the monitor had been put together. They found these braces. They found mustard bottles where the crew had eaten. Now, if we found in some musty library a document asserting that the crew had added some braces, and it also braced their taste buds by pouring mustard on otherwise inedible biscuits, then we'd be much more likely to say, ah, this sounds like a manuscript from 1870, rather than something written 100 years afterwards, when all that had been forgotten. Same thing with the gospel. There's amazing specific tale in there that adds to the credibility. And same deal with the Bible overall. I mean, your attacks, I'm, I'm, uh, it's interesting that you're rising in the bestseller list. I congratulate you. But these attacks are nothing new. They were. They were common in what's called the golden age of free thought in the late 9th century. Robert Ingersoll was a leading figure within the Republican Party of the time, and he was probably the leading orator in America. And he was also, by, in his own words, an implacable enemy of Christianity. Um, I mean, he, you, you share a lot with him. He called God an eternal fiend. He held God in abhorrence and contempt. He attacked God's infinite malice, his infinite lie. This is in the late 9th century. And he predicted as did lots of others, the imminent demise of religion in general, or Christianity in particular. And he said things similar to what Christopher B. Wright, that, that when religious groups had an educational monopoly, it was hard to mount an attack on the concept of revelation and miracles, but, but uh, here's what he wrote. Now that religion's monopoly has been broken, it's within the compass of any human being to see those evidences and proofs as the feeble-minded inventions that they are. So anyone can see that's feeble-minded. Well, what's happened? I mean, why is Christianity so strong in the U.S. now? Why is it expanding rapidly in Africa and South America, and especially in China? My wife and I were there last year. It is like wildfire. Um, to answer that, I think we need to turn your accusation on its head. It used to be that atheists could talk about the unique evil of religious dictatorships, and no one could show that the problem was broader than religion because we didn't have a track record of secular dictatorships. Now we do. Thought experiment. Imagine that in the... 20th century, in the biggest country by, long area, by, by uh, uh, area, by land area, also the biggest country by population, those two countries. Let's say that leaders were able to knock off Christianity and teach atheism in all the schools. Would things get better? Well, you might think, okay, we don't have to do a thought experiment. We have, to, we have actually the historical evidence, the Soviet Union and China. And they did establish atheism, and the results were not particularly pretty. And I'm not bringing up this evidence to say Christians are good and atheists are bad, but... If you're saying that religion poisons everything with the assumption that other things do not poison, it's, that's clearly wrong. 
Uh, you write about, I mean, these tar terrible things that went on with some of the, the uh, Quranic things, some of the, uh, uh, the Inquisition. Yeah, the Inquisition over the centuries apparently killed 5,000 people, which in my view is 5,000 too many. Stalin and Mao killed not 5,000 or 50,000 or 500,000 or 5 million even, but probably at least 50 million. That's the experience of atheism and power in the 20th century. And so it's remarkable. I mean, if you read this book here, I mean, Christopher writes about atheists respecting free inquiry and open-mindedness, not excommunicating each other. Well, yeah, the 20th century was a century of atheists not excommunicating each other, but murdering each other. Okay, what's the antidote to all this? One simple word called grace. Uh, John Newton, the author of that hymn, Amazing Grace, he was a slave trader. He became a Christian. He finally re realized the evil he had done. And with confidence, he could fight against slavery despite his past because he knew that his sins were forgiven. I mean, you talk about religions in general, you lump all the religions together, but Christianity does differ from other religions in its emphasis on grace. There are lots of religions that are bargaining religions. Yeah, I'll do this for you, God, or Allah, or Vishnu, or something, and you'll do something for me. Bargaining religions really cause big trouble often, but Christianity, which sometimes causes trouble, at least it's about grace. We cannot buy God off. We can't trade with him. And folks who get this find it enormously liberating. John Newton mentored a young member of parliament, William Wilberforce. Uh, that name's becoming familiar to some people this year because it's the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the British slave trade. Wilberforce fought for that for 20 years in parliament. It was he and other Christians in Britain who led the way. And parliament finally agreed in 1807 to abolish the slave trade. And then Wilberforce kept fighting for another 26 years to try to abolish slavery throughout the British Empire. And that finally happened in 1833, just a few days before he died. And what a, what a great life. He persevered. And he persevered because he got it. It's all about grace. Um, you know, I don't know what teaching you absorbed, uh, but it wasn't John Newton, it wasn't William Wilberforce. You know, when we, when we understand that God is our Father, we don't have to win our love by, as you say, mortifying our flesh or giving some money to religious authorities. We can't lose his love by asking hard questions, by arguing with him at times. Uh, it's not a police state or a banana republic, as you say, it's, it's love. I just wish you could get that. Religion poisons everything. Uh, Chesterton. A hundred years ago, G.K. Chesterton was asked by the Times of London to write, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton responded with two words, I am. <laughs> um, you know, so you can throw out, you can throw out my journalistic research, my historical research, and that of others. You can say it's all wrong. But here's Chesterton's reply again, what's wrong with the world? I am. You throw out everything else, and I can still tell you <coughs> that religion doesn't poison everything. And since I'm the guy defending Christianity here, and, and, and I'll end with another confession. You know, both you and I were married and divorced before our second marriages, which thankfully have lasted. I don't know your experience, but I do know mine. Uh, when I was an atheist in my early 20s, I was a lousy husband. I was married for two years. It lasted only that long. And, and, and you know, I became a Christian in 1976. And my marriage since then, is, it's lasted for three decades. Now, I'm obviously not saying that only Christians or religious people have long marriages. And I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that in my own case, in my own case, Christianity did not poison everything. Christianity was actually the antidote to the poison that was within me. Um, you know, I'm still selfish, but not utterly selfish. You know, without Christianity, my marriage would not have lasted. And I know that Christianity doesn't poison everything because I have, I have four fine sons. And before I was a Christian, I favored abortion. And if I hadn't come to believe in God, you know, some of those sons would not exist. Christianity does not poison everything. In my own case, in the case of millions of people, it's the antidote to poison. So you can say, Christopher, that religion poisons lots of things. I'll agree with you, but not everything. I'll also suggest that atheism poisons lots of things. There's plenty of poison to go around. We desperately need the antidote. Well, I think that was just fascinating, uh, just, just terrific. Now, we are to have questions, I believe, uh, from, do we have time? But Oops. Very, very brief questions oh, from the audience. May we do that? Very, very brief before we have the signing part of this. Let's ask in the audience, anybody who's not been numbed into silence <laughs> by this great debate in the back. Ma'am. Hello. That was really compelling, and thank you for sharing your time. Um, I wanted to ask Christopher, um, 
You referred to the Lord's Resistance Army as evil, which I completely agree, and it's a very sad state of affairs. Um, but I was wondering, in your use of the word evil, are you using it as an adjective, or can you believe in evil but not believe in God? No, I say in my book that I, I believe in, that evil is a real thing. I can't prove it. There are quite a lot of things I can't prove that I uh, couldn't be without. Um, a lot of people jeer when you say evil, especially when the president says it. They say, oh, can you say saying things are black and white when they're gray and so forth. You know how many liberals talk. If you put the word lesser in front of evil, you'll find every liberal's willing to use it. They do it every time at elections when they're considering who to vote for. Um, I think that, uh, I've, that I've been to places where I, there's no other word for what I've seen. It's the surplus value of sadism and dictatorship and slavery and so on. It's the gratuitous bit on top, the bit that's just there for thrills and that would be done even if it didn't do the perpetrator any good. The, the self-destructive, nihilistic element. I can't put it any more strongly than this. And you, when you smell it, when you see it, you'll know. Hope you never do. Sir. I wanted to first thank, is this on? I wanted to first thank the LBJ Museum for putting this on. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Um, I'm a Christian, I attend church. Uh, I tend to be a lot more to the left than the right because um, there's, just, there's this level of humanity that I find that tends to be a little more to the left. And maybe Dr. Olasky, you can help me with this. There is, it just seems like, um, um, I know it's biblical, it comes out of the Bible, and I, I've heard. Um, to keep in the theme of politics and religion, I've heard Governor Rick Perry say it, that if, if you're not a Christian, you're going to hell, and, and kind of that whole, there's a whole level of, I think it's, I call it a, a license to be arrogant um, that comes along with the religiousness, and I think, I think there's, there's a certain level of that, but I, I, I struggle, that's the point I really struggle when it comes to being a Christian, so I'd love to hear from you as far as your, of how you support that, that level of, of of arrogance, or, 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 or us and them is probably a more politically right way to say it, or, or um, you know, exclusivity. Yeah. Well, a good question that we could discuss for a long time, but I, I don't support us and them in that sense. Um, and I don't think that uh, the Christianity uh, is identical to the Republican Party or anything like that. Um, there is a uh, professor from Syracuse University who just came out with a book uh, in December uh, about, uh, about levels of both charity uh, and personal le levels of monetary charity and, and personal commitment, volunteer time. Uh, Arthur Brooks found that, in fact, whether it's religious left or religious right, uh, both groups uh, give about 40% more of money and time than people who are secular, whether on left and right. So the things that, that unite uh, Christians on the left or right are much greater than the things that divide us, and I'd say the same about, uh, about Jews and people of other religions, too. And Hamas. Um, I'm tempted to ask before we go to the next question. Since Christopher and I are non-Christians, will we go to hell in your mind? I'm, I'm never going to say that about anyone. It's not my call. Per the governor's comment, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Sir. So this question is for uh, Mr. Hitchens. So I'm interested. Um, I really appreciated the talk, and um, I was trying to keep an ear out for the arguments that you gave in support of your position. As I, as I understand it, the position is something like this. Um, there's no good reason to believe that religion in general and Christianity in particular is true, and in fact there's really good reason to think it's false. Is that right? So here's, here's an argument, or here's some gestures at arguments that you made. Um, you reported a kind of distaste for various Christian doctrines like omniscience and atonement and the doctrine of heaven and stuff. Um, so you said it's a horrible proposition, these things. So I don't know if that technically counts as an argument. I mean, there's lots of things that I found find distasteful, like certain propositions about cockroach reproduction and stuff just absolutely disgusts me. Mm -hmm. But that's not, that might be a reason to hope that it's false, but it's not a reason to think that it's false or believe that it's I false. I didn't right? imply that it was. Okay, so that's, that's so not So there's a reason to be glad of your reasoning. Oh, okay, so that's not the argument for the conclusion, for your position. So here's what I, maybe the argument was. You said there's this great plural, plural of here diversity of religious belief. Um, there's a lot of different religions out there, and if I'd been born in a different time in a different place, probably I would have had a different religious belief or something. Uh, so therefore I should buy my religious belief with a special suspicion or something. Um, mm, I'm not sure where we're going with that. So that doesn't seem like a Sorry? Good let, let me ask you, what, what's your question? Okay, I'll get to that in two seconds, okay. ready? So that doesn't seem like a good argument, because I mean, if I'd
time in a different place, so it would have different eth ethical beliefs. It doesn't give me a reason to doubt them. If you'd been born in a different time in a different place, you would have really different religious beliefs. Uh, doesn't give you a reason to doubt them. So here's the question. Uh, don't you agree? <laughs> I think I must have expressed myself very poorly um, in the first instance. If, uh, when I said, uh, but I, I seem to remember what I said, and I, I'll just have to submit myself to the, to the arbitration of you, my peers. I believe I said that it would be possible to be an atheist and be sorry with your conclusion, that you could be an atheist who wishes that uh, there was a God. Did I not say that? Uh, that uh, I've met such people. Uh, but that I, to the contrary, I'm an anti-theist who is very relieved, given what the implications of divine rule would be, that there is no evidence for the proposition. Now, I hope that's plain now. I'm wondering what the positive case was that religion in general is false and Christianity in particular. So I thought maybe one of the arguments was this diversity of religious belief maybe gives you a reason to think that your, your religion is false or something. Well, I say the diversity of religious belief is not mysterious if you assume that um, God is made by man. It's only mysterious if you think that man is made by God. Yeah. Like worrying about why tsunamis kill good people. This is not a problem if you think that we live on a cooling planet with a disturbed weather system. That's, that just will happen, doesn't require any explanation. No, nothing to pray over, nothing to why, why about. Nothing to have a sob fest on CNN about. Um, this question answers itself. It's only a mystery if you don't know that we live on a planet with a cooling crust and a turbulent climate system, um, and you think, well, maybe God uh, decides at what point weather takes people out. Occam's razor is the critical thing here. D dispose always of unnecessary assumptions. Um, does, uh, does the plague break out because we've sinned, and if so, is it because of our divorce rate? Is it because there are too many homosexuals in my Is it because the Jews have poisoned the wells again? Is it all this? Is it all that? That's what people used to have to ask, ask themselves about well into the 18th century until they worked out about the germ theory of the disease. Then they had to encounter people like Dr. Timothy Dwight, the great divine of Yale, who said, well, inoculation would be even worse because it would be an inter intervention in God's design, which, presuming that God wanted to keep the germ theory of disease from us and have us dying and thinking that disease was a curse would be true. It would be. Inoculation would be an interference with his design in that case. But this is the kind of mentality one's arguing against all the time. Currently, polio is spreading back across the world. We thought we had eradicated it. A lot of very good secular activists and medical physicians went out to do the eradication. I went with them as far as Bengal. Suddenly, religious people started to say, don't take your children in. This is a plot. Don't, God doesn't want you to do it. It, yeah. does, it only takes a few uninoculated children and the disease has spread all the way back across Africa now. Okay. Thanks to faith and the faith-based. If you're going to take credit for all the charitable work, you have to take credit for all the atrocities as well. And it will leave you exactly where you began, with everything still to be explained. On the right here, sir. Um, I have a question that's actually a two-sided question for, for each of the speakers. And the first would be uh, for Mr. Hitchens. If we are to get rid of religion and religious teachings, what then do we base our morality on, our um, mm -hmm. model for behaving well or doing yes. good? And then the other side of the coin uh, from Mr. Lasky is, it seems that your argument or, or your position precludes us having any morality or any good works to do without having religion to rely on to teach us those things. And, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about why it seems your argument or your position precludes that uh, um, position. Let me ask very, ask very quickly, Mr. Hitchens first, Dr. Olasky. Yes, second. I'll be first, but thank you for asking because I owe it, I owe it as an answer to Dr. Olasky too. Uh, morality comes from human beings. It's innate in us. We couldn't have got this far without it. Human solidarity requires it. Evolution necessitates it. The golden rule doesn't have to be taught to children. You may have to use a bit of uh, squeeze every now and then to make them conform to it, but they know what it is, understand it right away. It, I'll give an example very quickly from each of the two testaments. D do you really believe that the Jewish people got as far as Sinai under the impression that murder, theft, and perjury were okay? And only when they get, get there and told by God, actually, you've got to cut that shit out now. <laughs> and those are the commandments on, on his stone. Oh, up till then, we thought that was cool. They would not have got as far as... Of course, the story, as I've told you, and as you can easily find by reading my book and others, the, the story is all bogus, but suppose it to be true, that's the contempt it has for human beings, that they wouldn't know unless told 
that murder, uh, theft, perjury, to say nothing of adultery, you know, can mess you up. Of course they know. Uh, otherwise, we couldn't be having this discussion. Uh, we don't need religious permission to find these things out or supernatural authority for them. Another example, quickly, from the Second Testament, the good man from Samaria, the man who puts himself out, goes out of his way to help a suffering fellow creature who's described to us by the alleged Jesus of Nazareth, quite clearly wasn't a Christian. He, so he's doing something a while back that Jesus has got to hear about, is telling us about. He wasn't doing it because of Christian teaching, or as far as we know, for any religious teaching. He just saw another human in crisis and did what we all hope we would do, and some of us have sometimes done. Incidentally, if he was a religious Jew, as it's possible that he was, he would have had religious permission not to do that if it was a non-Jew on the other side of that road, because you don't have to help non-Jews, especially on the Lord's holy day, the Shabbat. You can leave them weltering in their own blood. In fact, you may be ordered to do so rather than break a commandment. So once again, only religion could make people act in a bad way in such a circumstance. Ordinary humanism is more than enough. All else is superfluous, explains nothing, and or leaves everything remaining to be explained. QED. Thank you. Dr. Lesh. Well, there's so much to say, but I actually will be terse. Uh, the, um, that was terse. I didn't, I didn't say short. <laughs> so, yeah, without, without taking up a lot of time, uh, you might want to go to uh, sort of a standard theological dictionary and look up this expression called common grace, which I think is one of the ways in which this is explained. But there are other things going on, too. There's a great theologian named uh, Francis Schaeffer that I'd recommend to people who has an expression uh, called living off the interest. In some ways, the society we have here, I mean, does depend on some of the teachings and understandings that developed a generation, two generations, three generations ago. And the question is, are we still adding to that? Or indeed, are we living off the interest at that point? So these are critical questions. I just want to mention also, if we're going to talk about uh, Timothy Dwight and inoculation, we should also just mention that one of the Puritan divines uh, who, uh, who, who gets uh, uh, often deservedly so, treated with sarcasm, was a fellow named Cotton Mather. And Cotton Mather in 1721 in Boston actually had no inoculation, working with a doctor named Dub Boylston at that time. Boylston Street's named after him. And, he, and, and Cotton Mather really pushed inoculation. He was a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences, and he pushed inoculation over the objections of lots of folks, including one of the newspapers in town that was run by James Franklin and his little brother Benjamin. So there are a lot of stories we could tell, a lot of history we could go into. We just don't have time for that tonight. Thanks for your question. We have two questions remaining, and then we're going to release everybody. Gentleman in the hat first, and then Senator Estes last. We'll, we'll close the evening. Sir. I was, hope, I was hoping for a, um, a debate like you had with uh, Mr. Galloway in New York, uh, where it was quite a knockdown, drag out fight, but I guess we need two Brits for that sort of discourse. <laughs> um, but I did want to uh, ask, y'all used to be uh, Marxist running buddies, and uh, now you're war in Iraq running buddies. Is this the product of vanity, ideology, or perhaps some sort of religion, religious commonality? <laughs> you want to... <laughs> Looking for the I wouldn't take door. a run at it. But, um... uh, Dr. Alessi. Um, Christopher can speak for himself of that, of course, as he, as he does very well. But uh, I just look in the war on Iraq as a subset of the war on terror, which... Uh, some people look upon that as a discretionary war. We can engage in it or not. Some people look upon it as an obligatory war. I tend to think it's an obligatory war. I don't like it at all. Uh, when I was writing columns about this back in 2003, I was hoping we didn't get into that in Iraq. Uh, but now we're in it, and what do we do? Uh, it's not an easy situation. It really isn't. I hate it. Uh, but it's a tough war we're in. An area of some comment. Well, um, I'm no longer a Brit, and uh, Mr. Galloway never was one. He's a renegade Scot. Um, <laughs> of the most revolting uh, die, and um, to have a debate on the order of that, I was, we would have to disappoint you because Mr. Galloway is a, is, a, is a thug and a liar and a demagogue and a man who has managed the odd feat of being able to be both a pimp for and a prostitute of Saddam Hussein. Um, my opponent tonight, I need hardly add, is a great deal more elevated in every respect than that, so sorry to disappoint you. I regard the war in Iraq as part of the war against religion. The faith-based parties of God are trying to level Iraq to barbarism, and they're very nearly succeeding. As well as killing each other's children, um, for their fellow Muslim children, which they don't scruple to do, they want to reduce by their, by their religious precepts a once highly civilized and sophisticated society to the level of Somalia 
or Afghanistan, which is what happens, by the way, to any country when you try to run it out of a holy book, I think we should hereby highly resolve that no country of such importance and no people of such civilization who have been through so much and whom we've promised so much shall ever be governed that way. We will not abandon them. The jihadists will never have Iraq. What we're doing there is one of the noblest undertakings the United States has ever made. May I follow up just briefly? As to the question, though, isn't it odd to find yourself allied with perhaps the most religious, fundamentally religious administration the United States has had in recent memory, and with a, a, a fundamentalist and evangelical or perhaps even a dominionist like Mr. Olasky? The irony is that the term compassionate I see conservatism, mean. we've seen how that's worked out. I perfectly out. understand that. I mean, all my friends in Iraq, my Iraqi and Arab and Kurdish uh, friends in Iraq are all secularists. Um, the, for all I know, everyone in the, every member of the 82nd Airborne Division is a professional snake handler. Uh, but what they happen to be fighting for is a secular Iraq. So I would think the irony was at the expense of the religious rather than the secular. Uh, last question in the night, Senator Estes. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to both of you for a tremendously stimulating debate. And Mr. Uh, Dr. Olasky, you've been a hero of mine for many years and uh, part of what uh, spurred me on to government service. But this is a question from, for the other side. Uh, uh, and I was glad you talked about Occam's razor, but uh, let, let's, let's get to the end of our life uh, individually. Uh, how do you uh, uh, answer Pascal's uh, wager? As far as uh, it, it, I've never heard an anti-theist, uh, mm -hmm. you know, explain maybe a short explanation of Pascal's I wager. I will be short. Yeah. Um, but and but I can also say that, as well as at fine bookstores everywhere, the, the my book, which you can get now, does have a discussion of this very question. So if I seem to stumble on by condensing it, you can get my more rounded view. Pascal's wager, in case it's not known to you comes from Blaise Pascal, who addresses his pensée to the, the one who is so made as that they cannot believe. That's me. And he says, well, let me put it to you like this. What have you got to lose? If you bet God exists and loves you and you're wrong, you're no worse off than you were already. If you bet uh, and, and uh, sorry, and you're right, there is no such thing. Uh, there's, you're no worse off than you were already. If you're wrong and there is, you win as long as you have said you uh, agree with him. So why don't you do it now while there's still time? I have two comments on this. One, religious hucksterism of the cheapest, vulgarest, nastiest kind it's possible to imagine. He says, what do you got to lose? I've got a good offer for you. Come into my used car lot. Come on, baby, just lie a little, and you never know. No, don't talk to me like that, and don't call it piety when you do, or, or be prepared to have piety despised. Second, Bertrand Russell, when asked this question, said, if confronted with his maker, he would say, I used to be able to do his accent, oh, Lord, you did not give us enough evidence. <laughs> um, I would go a little further. I would say, well, look, boss, if it's true what they say about you, that you're an infinitely kind, forgiving, all fatherly person, this is certainly what your fans keep saying, do you not have a little uh, room in your obviously very capacious uh, heart for someone who just couldn't bring himself to believe in you and really, honestly, truly couldn't? Um, as opposed to someone who won't spend half their life on their knees making fawning professions of faith because Pascal told them it was a good bet. Which of us is the more moral? Which of us is the more honest? Which of us is the more courageous? Which of us has the bluest eyes and is the most sexually attractive? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, which of us has the real charisma here? I'm just only asking. Well, uh, uh, he's running away. Well, he isn't. He's not even, he's walking away. Uh, we, we all could have spent our evening doing something else. This was terrific. We are very lucky, and how lucky we are to be in a place where we can have this kind of open discussion. Christopher Hitchens, Dr. Olasky, thank you both very much.